This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Yehovah gives us opportunities, talents, and abilities. But are we listening to the world when it comes to how we use them? Syndicated radio host, entrepreneur, and best-selling author Josh Tolley joins us today for a very important message about your future in this crazy world and how to protect your family from what's coming next. Wealth and Wisdom is up next because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. I'm your host, Scott Laird, and please welcome my co-host, the partner services and ministry development guru of A Root Awakening yeah. International. Yes, David yes. Robinson. Great to be here, Scott. <laughs> There's an yeah. intro for you. <laughs> Well, David, we are on the second Shabbat of the month of Tevet on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. And there we have it right there on your screen. And this may seem just like a regular day on the calendar, but this is something very important that happened on this day in history. This is the day that Yeshua taught the Lord's Prayer to all of his disciples. And it looks like, uh, you know, it might be the first time he taught this, but it's not. It's actually the second time. And I want to show you the two times where he did this. So in your Chronological Gospels Bible, which I have my own copy of it here, on page 170, we get to event number 140. This is when Yeshua leaves to minister in the land beyond uh, Perea after the Feast of Hanukkah. And we have the Lord's Prayer. And it says in here that uh, Yeshua first taught this pattern or outline for prayer to the few disciples who climbed the mountain with him uh, in the first recorded uh, in his first recorded message to Israel. But that was in event number sixty-two, and that was several months back. So let's go back there and see when the first time he did this. And this is on page one hundred in your chronological Gospels Bible. And uh, of course, we have the uh, Our Father in Heaven. We sanctify your holy name, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, and the rest of the Lord's Prayer, of course. The important thing about this is that at the end, you're not going to see something in the Chronological Gospels Bible that you may see in yours, and that is, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? The uh, the doxology, as it's commonly known. Doxology. That was added in, right? Right, yeah. And Michael, said he mentions that here. He says, it is not in any of the early Greek texts or in the ancient Hebrew Matthew, nor does it appear in the pattern for the prayer taught to another group of disciples seven months later, which we just read uh, on, page, on page 170 in the Chronological Gospels Bible. So there you go. That was not in the original text, and we talked all about that for six weeks with uh, Miles Jones. We just finished that up last week. This is Guardians of the Hebrew Gospels. Mm -hmm. And uh, Miles had a great, great stuff to say about what was in the Bible, what was not in the Bible, what was added. And it's a big eye-opener because everybody thinks that you know, the Bible yeah. always was the way it was, but it's not. No, it's not. And and, and through translations, you know, things have been added in, taken out, or it is, it's really important to know what the scripture says. It's really important to know the context of the scripture, to know the Hebraic mindset so you can understand the idioms and so forth, the scripture. And um, I was just reading in 2 Timothy 4, 3, it says, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Do you think that's now? I, I would say so. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We are in that time right now, and it's more important than ever for us as believers uh, uh, to understand what the scripture says. I mean, people are changing. Uh, well, God. I meant this in the word, or this this doesn't apply to us today. And the reason being is because they want it to suit their evil desires. And it's happening. It's happening in the churches. So it's really important that we stay strong, stay on the foundational truth of God's word, and, and know what it says. Yep, that's true enough. And you know, one of the best people doing that, of course, is our boss, Michael Rood. 
Yes. He, he just puts the truth out there. And if you don't want to accept it, that's fine. But more and more people are are knowing the truth because of Michael's delivery. He just he, there no, doesn't pull any punches. And that's so rare in this day and age that, you know, you just get the truth and nothing but the truth, if you will. <laughs> and, and that's just Michael's way. And, uh, you know, we want to be able to continue to do this into the future. And, you know, at the end of the year here, you always hear us saying this, that we we need to know where we, where we are going to be for the next year. And that is why we always do a pledge for uh, year-end giving or an appeal rather for year-end giving. Because even though the calendar changes and we say, yeah, but that's a pagan calendar, it shouldn't matter. Well, it still matters to the broadcasters and the rest of the world out there. And we kind of have to play that game if we want to be on the television stations, uh, which we want to do with the Chronological Gospel Season 3. Our editors are working on that right now. And so we're doing that in faith, not knowing where we can put this television series. That's right. You know, we'd like to put it on History Channel like it was before. Uh, we don't know where it's going to go. But in any event, people think, well, it shouldn't cost money. You know, the History Channel be, should be paying you for that. That's not the way it works. A lot of these places where you want to put these programs, you have to pay to play. You have to pay them, pay to get them on the air. And they want to know in advance. And they want to know in advance. And that's exactly my point. Exactly. You know where I'm going with this is that we need to know where we're going in 2021. And without your support at the end of the year, we don't know where we're going to be. We don't know what we can do. So next year, if you think, hey, how come I didn't see the Chronological Gospel Season 3 anywhere? It might be because, well, we didn't have the funds to do it in 2020. That's why. So we need to ask you for your support now. I know that a lot of people are hurting right now. Your friends and neighbors are hurting. You might be hurting. You know, obviously, take care of those folks first. That's, that's most important. Take care of your friends and family first. Make sure they're okay. And then we would ask that if you have anything that you can give to us to, in order to get the word out in 2021, we would really appreciate your support. And uh, you may have seen a letter come in the mail recently about that uh, from Ted Clayton explaining why we need to do this. And it's essentially what we just talked about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very important. It, it helps us plan. I mean, we need to be able to plan, especially when you're looking at new productions, you know, in the... The, the constant changing of technology. We're faced with these things every year. Uh, we don't plan on it, they come. And, um, you know, and, and you know, we need to give uh, Yahovah the best of technology, the best of what we can do, not settle for the cheapest or, or you know, just whatever we can to get by. He deserves the best. And, right. you know, our partners have that vision. And it's so wonderful to see people continually give and help support this ministry. Yeah, I think we need to give a shout out to those folks who give all year round. And we want to thank you in advance. Partners. We have some great partners. And it's, it's so wonderful getting, not just, just having partners, that they're just a statistic. We try to get to know our partners. We want to know about their lives, about what uh, this ministry is doing for them and, and how they're able to use the, the things of this ministry to minister to others. You know, it's wonderful stories all the time we get. Yeah, you know, one of those things, just real briefly, is the uh, December love gift. That's an easy way to give to the ministry is through the love gift. If you give a donation, Michael says, you know what, to those folks that want to give to this ministry, I want to give them a teaching that not everybody else gets. And that's what the love gift is all about. And we have several different levels. For $50 uh, donation, you can get just Michael's teaching. Or for $100, we have another set of gifts. And then uh, for the $300 level, we also have this beautiful gift. Uh, it's only a few days left to get it. It's a, a wall hanging or something you can hang outside. It's a ceramic doves that spell the word shalom. But the part I wanted to get to was uh, there's something also in this gift that's provided by one of our partners. And this is a partner who's created something before. They're very creative, the Garvin family. And uh, they've created a, a, a card game before that we, we have uh, given through the Love Gift program, and now they have a matching game. It's a biblical matching game and a coloring book that you'll also get with uh, the Love Gift. And not only are you helping A Rude Awakening with this gift, you're also going to help them along with their ministry called Teshuva Ministries. So we want to thank you for doing that. And uh, David, thank you for always sourcing the Love Gifts. You are the one that uh, defines all these things that can go with Michael's teachings. You're welcome. All right, well, Yehovah gives us opportunities, talents, and abilities, but are we listening to the world when it comes to using those talents and abilities? Syndicated radio host, entrepreneur, and best-selling author Josh Tolley joins us to share a very important message about your future. That's coming up next. Yeshua was a rule breaker, but not in the sense that modern Christianity would have you believe. Far from nailing the Torah to the cross, Yeshua purposely broke the rules of the Pharisees, not the Bible. And there's a big difference. If you want to really be healed, 
then you violate man-made rules and regulations. You set yourself free from the doctrines and commandments, the dogmas, the takeno and ma'asim of the Pharisees and of religious leaders and of men. In Righteous Disobedience, Michael Root helps deconstruct modern assumptions of the ancient world and build a proper understanding of why Yeshua did what he did. But the only way to see it is to receive it as our gift. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Righteous Disobedience on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you the teaching plus Go Match, an all-new Bible story matching game made by Teshuva Ministries, plus the Go Match coloring book. These gifts are perfect for teaching your children and grandchildren the Torah and how it relates to their lives as believers in Yeshua. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you Righteous Disobedience, the Go Match Game and Coloring Book, plus this beautiful yard art featuring handmade doves etched with the Hebrew word for peace, Shalom. These gifts are available only in December and supplies are limited. Make your donation now and receive the $50 gift the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Remember, this offer ends December 31st and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. Thank you for your donation to A Root Awakening International. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took bread and he blessed the Most High. Barukata Yehovah Elohim Malakalam Hamotzi Lachem Miharetz, and he said, "This represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do it from now on, understand this has always represented my broken body." And often, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of what I am about to do for you. Then he took his cup and he told his disciples after he blessed it, after he blessed the Most High, and he said, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Barei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth and has created the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, you divide my cup of among yourselves. And as he passed his cup around and they poured a bit of his into their cups, it got back to him empty and he said, I will not drink a drop of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. But as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Not only that I will pay for the broken covenant, that I will pay for the transgression, that I will renew the covenant in my blood but also remember that I am waiting for you at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that is when I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. Earlier this year, we had a pandemic hit, so to speak, something called COVID-19, perhaps you've heard of it. Well, for a lot of people, their world went 
down through the floor. And it didn't have to be that way. And one person who knows that better than anyone is entrepreneur, author, business owner, investor, Josh Tolley. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Hey, Scott, great being with you. How are you doing? Good, thank you, good. You know, I'm doing well. Everyone here at the ministry is doing well, thanks to partners who kept on giving through the pandemic. They saw the light by keeping to to uh, believe in those things and, and to donate to those things which they believed in. And some people did not take the right path. We talked about giving last year uh, before any of this happened. And uh, I, can, I think there's kind of an I told you so in there if people had only listened to you last time. I wonder if we could reiterate that for folks who are saying, how could I have avoided this? What did I do wrong? So for those who, whose life went through the floor, what did they not do right? So, you know, it's it's interesting. As we circle back on a year since the last time I joined you, a lot of I told you so has kind of happened. But one of those things is, you know, God tells us from Genesis to Revelation, we're supposed to be entrepreneurs. That is his model of securing capital. And people tell me all the time, oh, well, Josh, God provides. He provides for me like he does the sparrow. Absolutely true. But God doesn't provide to the sparrow where the sparrow can just sit in his nest and then poof, bird feed shows up in his gut. He still has to go out and get what God provided. Well, entrepreneurship is that same model. And that's what God has given us from Genesis to Revelation as a way believers are supposed to secure their family income. And when we were together last time, we were talking about that. We were talking about how to be an evangelpreneur, how to, how to walk that out with faith. And one of the benefits when we address that topic was that you're never caught off guard. You're never surprised by what's gonna happen because there's this myth that there's nothing more secure than your job. You know, I, I hear this a lot, Scott, where people are like, oh, I'd love to start a business, but I need to put food on the table and a roof over my head. So I have to have a job. Well, what COVID taught us was there's nothing less secure than a job. Jobs lasted about four and a half minutes and then everybody was getting laid off. We hit up over 50 million unemployed people. We also realized that that money that we thought was going to be worth something, whether it was equity in our home or our 401ks or anything that the experts taught us was secure, really wasn't, which we also talked about and I put in the book. And it's so sad. And I, I, I we shouldn't make light of it because it is sad. But it's so sad how many millions of people we're making money, saving money, and keeping money the way of the world, and then this happened. And they said, well, why did it happen to us? Why wouldn't you think it happened to you? And God's way was saying, okay, this is how you make money, and then once you make it, this is how you're a good steward with it. And those people were not caught off guard. Those are the people that kept your ministry afloat. Those are the sort of people who, like myself, actually have businesses that are booming during COVID. So there's this, there's this, I guess, contrast happening in the world right now. And everybody saw what the world said to do with money. And then, you know, did it really work? And it didn't. I remember we had this guy call up. He had $400,000 in equity in his home, paid up equity. He still owed on the house. But he goes to the bank and says, hey, I need $20,000 to kind of help my family get through. And he's thinking, well, my parents taught me there's nothing smarter than buying a home. You build equity, right? And he goes to the bank to get the 20 grand and they looked at him and go, uh, no. Well, why not? It's, it's paid up equity because you lost your job. And we don't understand that in the world's financial system, it is so fragile. Forget about how big the number is or how many commas are in it. When you operate financially in the world system, the entire thing is fragile. And that's what a lot of people realize. Now, what are some things, so obviously there are some success stories in this too, where not everybody's life went through the floor. As you said, your businesses are booming. Uh, now, because a, a pandemic like this or a stock market crash or anything like that, all it is is a transfer of wealth from one person to another. The money did not go anywhere. It's like matter. There's only a certain amount of matter. It can be trans or energy can be transformed from one form to another. So what have you seen, maybe an example or two of, of some businesses that actually boomed during this time? Sure. So we happen to own a clinic. Uh, we sold the business in the clinic. I used to own the clinic and the business inside. We sold the business inside, but we still own the clinic. And that business has boomed because a lot of people that were trusting the big medical healthcare systems all of a sudden realized, well, wait a second, that's where the viruses are. I don't want to go where all the people with COVID are. 
So private clinics actually started just exploding. So you have that. You're also getting a lot of smaller retailers starting to boom again because people are getting sick and tired of just shopping online. Shopping online was cool when it was an option. Then when you had to do it, all of a sudden going to the local store that's still open owned by a local person actually had some additional value to it. So those are booming. People who offer services in person. Uh, I know a lady who's starting to do um, um, like uh, field trips for homeschool kids because a lot of kids are now homeschooled. One of the biggest parts of being in school when, when you were in public school was field trips. That's where you made some of the best friends and got a lot of experiences. Well, you don't get that with homeschool. So she started a field trip for homeschoolers company, just exploding. So there's a lot of opportunity. And there's always a million ways to make a million dollars, and you have to be prepared to look for that opportunity. But at the same time, you also have to secure that capital. It's all about the dry powder, right? In, in the markets, they say you have to keep that dry powder. Well, you have the income stream and the dry powder. And if you can control both of those the way God told you to, then you're in a position, no matter what comes, you're able to take advantage of those opportunities. So let's say you're in the position of that person who had $400,000 of equity in his house, and he didn't have, any, didn't have a job. What can a person in that position do? Can they, can they take some equity out of their house and start a business, or what would you recommend someone do in that case? So in, in that sort of situation, whenever you're using a bank for your lending device, you're always going to be at the will of the bank. And that's a bad position to be in. Bob Hope has this famous quote that says a bank will gladly lend you money as soon as you can prove to them you don't need it. And unfortunately, that is really, really true. So what I'm telling people is start something entrepreneurial right now. Start something. It doesn't have to be your main source of income, and it's not about Ferraris and Jets. It's about having something that's not dependent on the system. So now, even if it's 500, 600 bucks a month, you have a little bit of an engine. You can always add fuel to that and grow it. And then with the capital you have, start asking yourself, well, wait a second, if I'm gonna be a good steward of the money that is coming in, what does that mean? And when we look at the parable that Jesus tells where the dude who buries it, and Jesus didn't use the word dude, I'm paraphrasing, but the dude who buries it, what happens to that guy? He gets punished. He doesn't just get it taken away, he gets punished. Well, when we look at what we're doing with our money today, a lot of us are burying it in the bank. That's a very dangerous place to bury it. That's, that's what the Bible actually calls a money changer. The other place we bury it is in some sort of Wall Street-based product that's so vulnerable. It literally, Scott, goes up and down by the second. It's a little ticker on the bottom of your screen. Well, you wouldn't let a five-year-old keep the important money that way. And I'm not saying that those two entities are bad, but it's, it's, it's just not the best stewardship. Now, if you have extra money and you want to play the market, go for it. Go for it. But again, 401ks proved, the, proved this all right, because what did the government have to do with 401ks? Wave all the fees associated with them because people realized, wow, this really isn't a liquid asset that I could ever count on. So right now, the government's waiving fees for you to take your 401k out because most people realized, ah, that was kind of a ripoff more than an asset. So what are some liquid places where people could put their money and be a good steward instead of putting it in the bank? Because even Yeshua says, uh, at least put it in the bank where it could gain some interest. But you know, right, obviously these days, there's not a lot of interest to be had. So what do you do? Where do you put it? Where yeah, do you invest that's, it? That's, that's a great observation. So the bank right now isn't giving you interest. Wouldn't it be nice if we had the banks that even Jesus had? <laughs> right now, the bank is, is lending out your money. They're gonna make five, 10, 14%, depending on what they're lending out to. And they're gonna pay you 0.025 if you're lucky. <coughs> Excuse me. And then if you're lucky, they're gonna say, okay, well, we'll let you put it in a, in a secured account, right? A CD or something that has FDIC insurance. What we need to realize when it comes to banks is first, they own the money. As, as soon as you deposit money in the bank, it legally becomes property to the bank. That means you are now a creditor to the bank. That doesn't seem like a very good steward. So when you're looking at options, option one is to keep it in something that's liquid. So metals can be kind of liquid. Uh, I have a I have a teaching on you know how valuable is your gold really, but metals kind of liquid. 
you can place it into a business of your own. This is something that people don't think of as an investment, but they really should. If if you're going to deposit $5,000 into your Roth IRA or something, why not put $5,000 into your own business? If that thing makes $50, you're now beating the bank. If it makes $500, you're now beating the market. And people don't think that way. The other place you can place money that people just fail to realize is you can place money if you have a right vehicle through an insurance vehicle that allows it to stay liquid. And it also protects it against any back loss as you gain compounded interest. So you do have options. Just most people aren't educated on them. They think bank stock market. You know, and it's funny, uh, if we mentioned before uh, entrepreneurship. So I, I see a lot of this happening, especially lately, uh, where people are becoming coaches. Coaches of anything. If you know something, you've lost your job, and you say, gee, you know what? I was a CEO for 20 years, and all of a sudden I lost my job due to COVID. I know a lot about running a business. Perhaps I should become a business coach to teach others about how to run a business properly, or a health coach, or, or this or that. Or if you have any kind of knowledge, it seems like you can make money being a coach. And I wonder how many people have actually thought about that. Well, it turns out millions of them have. So this is, a, this is an industry that really needs a little bit of, of policing. And I want to make sure that the people who are coaches out there who actually know what they're doing, get the credit they deserve. Part of the, the blessing and the curse of the internet is anybody can say they are anything they want to be. So on the opposite side of that, you also have programs for the right amount of money, Scott. That book about all that wonderful information can have your name on it. Or for the right amount of money, Scott, they can develop a program for you and now you're just the coach. So you really have to be careful with that. But with that being said, if you do have a skill, a real skill that people are wanting, that is an instant business. It just is. I mean, it, and, and we've known this for a long time. When you look at um, people in, in how they've come out of the Great Depression, well, my grandma taught piano to two kids in the neighborhood. That helped. Two kids. Yeah, think about it. If, if, if you had two people paying you $20 a month each, well, that's $40 a week. That's $160 a month. That's now food for somebody in the family. And it didn't take anything to get that started. Mm. There are so many ways that we can make money without money. It's not even fun. You just rhymed right there. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> <laughs> next, next one's going to be punny. <laughs> So now, uh, we appreciate you coming on Shabbat Night Live. You are doing this uh, out of your own time. And so I, I want to uh, thank you, first of all, for, for coming on. And secondly, um, you teach people how to start their own business. And you know you have something called Purple Monkey Garage. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that's all about and what, if people are thinking about starting their own business and saying, yay, you know what? Josh is right, I need to do this, but I haven't the faintest clue how to get started. Can Purple Monkey, your business, help them do that? Yeah, it can, actually. Uh, PurpleMonkeyGarage.com, PurpleMonkeyUniversity.com. I also wrote a book on it called Evangelpreneur, and it really, it, it comes down to this. Every family, every family should have some element of entrepreneurship because that's the one that's between you and God. When you're, when you're counting on your money, between you and your boss. Well, now it's not even a, a question of, is that good stewardship? Now you have to start asking yourself, are you equally yoked? So we help people through that entire process. And through our parent company, Shift Capital, we actually make a point of wealth education, wealth creation, and wealth protection. Because one of them without the other two becomes unbalanced and you see that spin out of control too. How many millionaires have we seen end up poor or blow the money or not know how to get it back? So we really focus on wealth education, wealth creation, and wealth protection. Okay, that's excellent stuff to know. So now, uh, we're gonna get into uh, giving a little bit because that is also a good part of stewardship, uh, being good with your, your money. Because if, if you're not, uh, if you're just getting, uh, giving, or pardon me, if you're just working to get and keeping it all, well, that's not good stewardship either. So what is the importance of uh, giving just from a practical standpoint? Well, there's there's a reality to it. There's there's you know there's a godly reality to it. Some of the biggest, I think, people who most people would consider bad guys gave a lot because this is what I hear all the time. Well, why are why are they prospering? They're evil. Why are they prospering? They're in the mafia. Why are they prospering? Because they're still giving. It's like the law of gravity. You know, Al Capone set up the first soup kitchen in Chicago. 
He also set up the first charity to give clothes to wounded veterans. And Al Capone prospered. I mean, obviously, don't be like Al Capone, but there's a reality to that. You have the Rockefeller family, who a lot of people don't agree with. But what was one of the key things that J.D. himself said, you have to do more than make money, you have to give money. So even when he was broke, he was giving 10% of the broke amount that he had. There's a reality. The other thing it does is it lifts you up too, Scott. And this is one of the things that I wish more people would talk about when it comes to giving. When you're down in the dumps, when you're feeling so broke that you can't give, you're feeling defeated. (coughs) Excuse me. You're feeling defeated. And that defeated feeling tends to cascade. Then you then it you take it out on your spouse or your kids or if you do have a job or you're looking for a job, it makes you less productive. But when you give, it lifts you up. It just lifts you up. We did this yesterday. I had somebody in the car with me as we went through a drive through And I said, you know, have you ever done the thing where you pay for the person behind you? And they said, no, I've never done that. And I said, watch. And we told the, the young guy in the window, hey, I want to pay for the person behind me. And it was so crazy how that uplifted. It was only like 12 bucks, but it was it, it was so amazing how that uplifted everybody's spirits for the rest of the day. You know, that little tiny act. So when you give, it actually helps build yourself up too because it, it, it reinstills this idea that hope exists because you just gave it to somebody else. It's like a mirror. And then there's just this, this idea of good stewardship. You know, if, if you're making money and you can bless other people with it, or you're making food and you can bless other people with it, or you have an extra blanket or you can bless somebody with it. You're doing what God's calling you to do. It's God never called us just to observe. He called us to observe, listen and do, right? Read and do. What does it, what, what good does it to, to just be a reader of the word and not a doer of the word? So he tells us, okay, go out and do it. And when you do what God wants you to do, you are going to get a benefit, even if it's just making God happy. And if you're telling yourself you love God, then making him happy should be enough of a reason to do it in the first place. But what I find interesting is the Bible, which supposedly everybody believes, right? It tells you time and time and time to give. We can have an argument about was tithing done away with irrelevant because you're still supposed to give. Old Testament, New Testament, pre-death and resurrection, post-death and resurrection, you're supposed to give. So start giving and see how wonderful that makes you feel. And oddly enough, it's almost like he, he being God, kind of blesses you in little ways where as soon as you give, you get this little bitty, what my wife calls a God wink. You just get a little wink. And it doesn't mean, you know, you give $10 and a thousand falls out of the sky, but it could mean you give $10 and you find your lost keys that you couldn't find. You know, just these little tiny things start happening. And it's a wonderful thing to watch. Indeed, I find the same thing with health. People say, well, how come people, even atheists who are in the hospital with cancer, can believe enough that they will be healed of this, not even believing in God, just believing that their body will heal it and it happens and they get healed. And Christians are baffled by this. How can this happen? They didn't even believe in God. It's because God has built this into every human being. Whether we choose to use it or not and recognize where it came from, well, that's up to you but he's built it into each of us. And same thing with, with giving. It's uh, like you said, with the Rockefellers or whomever, or Donald Trump who stopped by and, and helped somebody who, who had a flat tire or something like this, and nobody ever gives him credit for that. All these type of things. If, if we give, we will receive because it is a biblical principle and they are universal, not whether or not you have accepted Christ. I mean, it's, it's, just a, it's just a thing. So if you're enjoying this talk that we're having with, uh, with Josh Hawley, stay tuned. We have a lot more coming up in just a second. But first of all, we've been talking about giving, and now is your opportunity. If, if anything Josh here has said has resonated with you, we would certainly appreciate your supporting Shabbat Night Live because it's still... It costs a lot, a lot of money to put on Shabbat Night Live and to, to bring this to you. And we certainly appreciate your support. Uh, we just love how you supported Shabbat Night Live all through the year, and we appreciate Josh uh, coming on with us this year. And so uh, we just ask that you would uh, consider that in your heart, and we'll give you a couple minutes to think about that.
and thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live as we reach the end of the year here, the end of the calendar year. We really appreciate your support. It's when we can plan for the next year. I need to just tell you a little story about my son. He's 17 years old. He's blown through a couple of rental investment books. He loves to play a few stocks on the Robinhood app on the phone. He loves to sell watches online. He likes to buy watches and fix them and flip them and put them back on eBay. And he's frustrated because he's only 17 and he wants so badly to establish his own limited liability company uh, corporation, but he can't because he's 17. Now, Josh, I think that's probably your quintessential definition of an entrepreneur just aching to bust out and do something. That is exactly how it's supposed to be. I remember I was 12 years old and I was already making more money than some of my teachers. You know, it's it's really what God makes us to be. And this is what's really interesting about this, Scott. People ask me all the time, you know, well, are we all supposed to be entrepreneurs? I mean, can't some of us be employees? You can do whatever you want, but God designs every kid to be an entrepreneur. I've been all around the world, spoken to all different sort of racial backgrounds, religious, ethnic, income brackets. And if you look at children, all of them are entrepreneurs, all of them. Sally will have a fruit roll up, Billy will have a Twinkie, they'll trade. They are born to be entrepreneurs. We're the ones that stop it. We're the ones that say, stop doing that. Don't trade your apple or whatever. And then we teach them to be employees. We, we have now created a culture that is just solely focused on go to school, get good grades, go to college, get more good grades, and go get a job. And this is supposed to be the answer to life. And statistically, there's nothing risky. There's nothing risky. And what's funny is when I was a child, well, child, when I was a teenager, they used to run these television ads that say, you know, well, if you have a college degree, it means more than a million dollars more earnings in your life than if you don't. They got rid of those ads because they realized they were lying to people. Your odds of becoming a millionaire are actually higher if you have a 2.75 GPA or lower. And there's a real reason for this because the there's this, this quintessential expression, A students work for B students, B students are managed by C students, and D students own the company. That is statistically true. You, you told you us look, that last year, I remember this. It is, and it's true. When you, when you look at the Forbes 400, Number one, number two, number five, number seven dropped out of school. Like there's there's a reality. And I'm not telling kids who are watching this drop out of school. But what I'm saying is we have to stop squashing that entrepreneurial drive that kids naturally have. Matter of fact, hold on one second. I'll get you proof. I'm in my, you know, I'm in my television studio. And on our shelf, I have a book from 1929. It's fragile. It's almost 100 years old. But it's a textbook. And this is for seventh graders. We were teaching people in seventh grade, unless you're the dunce in the corner who's going to go be an employee, you're going to go start a business. And the first chapter is paying your laborers. I could teach an NBA level business course out of what we taught seventh graders in 1929. Wow. We have to move a long way in a bad, in a bad direction because now it's all about repetition, repetition, repetition regurgitating answers in order to get them employed. Wow, that is incredible. So kids are meant to be entrepreneurs. And now my kid is homeschooled. He's been homeschooled his whole life. He's in 11th grade now. And I think probably that's why he is the entrepreneur. He sees there's a different way uh, as all his buddies at school have been doing one thing, he can do another and will be supported for it because we see that in him. So if someone has a child in regular school, how do we raise a kid who, is, who can be an entrepreneur? Great question. So there's a few things we can do, and it, it's all age dependent, of course. But one of the first things we need to do is stop giving uh, timeouts based on time and give punishment based on what I call family dollars. When you're telling a child you're on timeout for a day, an hour, whatever, you're grounded for a week, what they're learning is freedom comes with time served. That's what employment is. That's literally, oh, when I'm turned 65, right? So you instead change that modality in their mind and say, okay, you're on timeout or you're grounded until you earn 500 family dollars. Now, 500 family dollars can be things like you get 70 of them for cleaning out the garage. You get 
a hundred of them from mowing the widow's lawn next door, whatever it is. But now they are deciding how much is freedom worth. They're deciding how bad do they want it. And they're creatively thinking, okay, what am I willing to do to get this? And it takes that idea of, well, I hate you. You're not letting me go to Billy's pool party. It's not me, Jack. It's you. You could have been out an hour ago. But that's one thing that I really love. The second thing that I really love when it comes to raising children is stop giving them an allowance for things that you don't get paid to do around the house either. So stop with this, oh, mom gets paid on Friday, I get paid. If a child's going to make money in a home, then you have to teach them to make money through entrepreneurship. So when they're six years old, that might be a lemonade stand. When they're 16, that might be a car detailing company, whatever it happens to be. But there's a few keys to this. They don't do any business longer than six months. You're not trying to create the Donald Trump of lemonade. In addition to that, tax them. Because what was one of the biggest shocks when you got your first paycheck, right? You're like $5 an hour, 20 hours, that's 100 bucks, 65, 42. Where'd the other money go? Taxes. So they switch businesses every six months and then you tax them. Now, don't spend that tax money on a new fedora on yourself. You know, save it for a fund for them or something. But get them used to how the system works. What this will create is a solution to the biggest problem that I face in my business. I have thousands of adults who are going, Josh, I can't think of any business that I can do. Because you weren't taught to think of businesses. I have started businesses between exits on the highway. I have started businesses with no money in Florida on YouTube, pretending we're homeless and by lunch made 40 grand. It's not a business problem. It's a how we think problem. So when you teach your kid to start a new business, Every six months for 12 years, that's 24 businesses. I could take that child, drop him off in Singapore with $50, come back a year later, and he'll be middle class. So that's part of that idea of raising those entrepreneurs. And in addition, take them with you on your entrepreneurial journey. That's one of the biggest distinctions between people who are born in America and people who come to America. People who come to America come to be entrepreneurs. The people who are already here. Even if we do try it, it's something we do outside of our family time so the kids never really see it, which is why traditional American businesses now will never make it past the second generation, whereas one in seven people from India are millionaires in America. You know, I, I see that because uh, we have something at home, we do a, a little bit of a health thing on the side uh, called Laird Wellness, uh, at lairdwellness.com. And, and we run a, a Facebook Live every Tuesday night. Well, while my, while my wife and I are hosting it, uh, my son came to us with his entrepreneurial spirit and said, hey, you guys need someone to manage your chat while you guys are on because you can't be looking at the chat while you're on. So why don't you let me field the questions for you? I thought, that is a brilliant idea, why don't you? So he sits in the room next to us and he manages the chat for us and then refers any questions to us later. But that's how he's seen exactly what you're talking about. He's seen us take on us, our entrepreneurial spirit, and he wants to join in and do it. And he's also done this. I wonder if this is advisable, if you advise people to do this. He took a look around our house and said, what do mom and dad own that just sits there that I could be making money with? We recently acquired a pressure washing machine. He noticed there was a lot of dirty driveways in the neighborhood. And he knows that if you're going to pressure wash somebody's house, well, somebody's gonna be pretty sensitive about that, but their driveway, eh, they'll probably let a kid do that. So he is now starting a, pressure, a driveway pressure washing business at 25 cents a square foot. And so that's what he saw. Mom and dad have a possession I can make money with. Is that something you would encourage other kids to do? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even give kids another one. Take, uh, go to the dollar store, get a stencil set with numbers on it, and go through a neighborhood and get a $1 spray can of paint and say, look, nobody can see your number on your house. When the pizza guys come in, the Uber, the DoorDash, whoever, how many times do people pass your house? All the time. Well, for $10, I'll spray paint your number on the curb so people can find you. You could make $1,000 going down one side of the street. So there's so many ways to make money. That's a great example, Scott. There's so many ways to make money. And I think one of the things we need to get back to is encouraging our children to think that way. And, and, and again, rewarding it. Rewarding it. I remember I was on the air when Steve Jobs died. 
And this lady calls into my show and she's like, well, we need more Steve Jobs is, is, is whatever the plural of that is. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Wait, do you really believe that? Because if your son or daughter called you and said, mom, I'm dropping out of school, you'd have a heart attack. And then if, if your son or daughter said, oh, no, by the way, I'm starting a business, you'd be resurrected just to have another heart attack. Don't tell me you want people to do what Steve Jobs did when you're telling your kids don't do it. And we need to we need to get back to that place where we realize entrepreneurship is what God tells us to do from Genesis to Revelation. Now, seeing mom and dad run a business is one way kids can learn, but they also need to learn from mom and dad giving, right? And that's another reason why we need to give consistently, uh, especially at the end of the year. This is when ministries are looking for, uh, forward to planning for the year uh, to decide what they can and cannot do. And when mom and dad give an extra amount over and above, I mean, that teaches a valuable lesson as well, doesn't it? Just like the tax situation you were talking about. Well, and get them involved in the giving. I just gave a presentation not too long ago to a group of family offices. So we're, we're talking pretty wealthy people. But the, the, the concept was, how do we get our children to be as philanthropic as we are? And the whole seminar was kind of similar to this. And I said, look, you have to get them involved in the giving itself. It, you know, it, let, let me paint, it, paint an illustration. Who are some of the naughtiest kids in school? Preacher kids. We call them PKs for a reason. And it, 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 it ties back into your giving, I promise. But watch how this works. When a preacher kid is growing up, he hears from his mom and dad, stay here, Billy. Mom and dad have to go to the board meeting. Stay here, Billy. Mom and dad have to go pray at the hospital. Stay here, Billy. Mom and dad have to do whatever, right? He's not involved. Who are some of the wellest behaved children? Missionary kids. Same industry, but what's the difference? Come on, Billy, we gotta go pray for the homeless. Come on, Billy, we got to go feed the disaster relief. Come on, Billy. So by getting them involved, you have families that are fifth, sixth, seventh generational missionary families. Whereas when you're not getting them involved, you have preacher kids who are knocked up doing heroin by the time they're 15, right? So the same thing is true with the giving. If you get them involved in the giving, remember that tax money I had you take from them? What if that was their giving fund? Who do they give to? Why do they give to it? Make them deliver the check or give the cash if it's applicable. Even when they're little, even when they're little, obviously give to great ministries like this one. But even if it's $5 to a homeless person, let the little six-year-old give the money and watch that little six-year-old get addicted to giving. You know, I, that's totally true. Because I remember when uh, I had a, uh, a situation here at A Rude Awakening where I, when I was still from, uh, still working on a visa here from Canada, I now have my green card, but when I was working on a visa, there was a mix-up and a misunderstanding with immigration. And, and the long story short was, I was not able to get paid for nine weeks. So I knew what that was like not getting paid, and that was the scariest thing. And all of a sudden, I looked at the guy on the side of the road thinking, I know how he feels now, and I'm gonna be a lot more philanthropic to him. And we, we, our kids saw us go through that. And ever since then, we now keep money in the glove box just in case we see somebody on the side of the road. And quite often, I know a couple of years ago, I remember our son stopped us and said, Dad, stop here. And we're like, why? He says, there's a guy on the side of the road. Can I give some money to him? And he knew that there was money in the glove box and it was almost, he felt it's his obligation uh, to give that to that person. Now, 10%, do we give more? Do we give less? What does the Bible say? What do you think? What's your opinion on this? Man alive, that is a theological hot button because I kind of alluded to it before. You have some people say, oh, well, you don't have to give the 10% and we're not an agricultural society anymore. And it was talking about wheat. I'm going to leave that to people like Michael Rood and, and those women to kind of argue and figure out. But what I do know is you should be giving and you can't outgive God. And I'm not one of the, you know, if you give a thousand, he's going to give you a million. No, that's not how everybody doesn't get their best life now. Sorry. But I will tell you that if you give, it's a good thing. It is a good thing to give. And my own personal story, whenever I was the most down and out, because I'm not, I was not like I was born wealthy. I was homeless for a while. But when I was in my most down and out, even through simple little acts of giving, obviously giving at church, but maybe, you know, tipping as much as the bill was when I saw a waitress who was kind of, you know, not doing too well financially. It was amazing how something always happened for me. You know, it's even even with my books, I was I was in this situation where I 
was giving and I didn't really feel like it, you know, because God is that way sometimes. And I didn't want anything from it. I wanted to stay anonymous, all that sort of stuff. And God was just pushing me to give. So I did. And I tried to remain anonymous. And this was right when my book, Evangelpreneur, came out. And somebody who found out I gave wanted to thank me. And I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to thank me. And it went back and forth. But it turns out that he was a pastor of a massive church that now buys Evangelpreneur books by the case and gives to everybody. So there's just this this way that it just seems to come back. It and does. It, if you are really watching this and you're thinking, well, I hate these giving messages. Should I really give? That's a clue that you should. Nobody who's giving enough goes, man, I really hate giving. That's a clue. It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, let's be honest, you're probably in better shape than I am. I've hit the drive-thru. I already admitted it, right? <laughs> I feel worse going through the drive or going through the health food store, right? Than somebody who's already healthy. Well, the same is true with giving. People who are already giving don't feel this, oh man, I always feel like I have to give. It's the people who know they're not giving enough who reject messages like this. Mm. That's the people who really have to start giving. But on the flip side of that, those are the people who are going to have that massive sense of, oh my gosh, what took me so long to start giving sort of feeling when they finally do. And I think it's the same feeling, isn't it, when somebody starts a business saying, why did I spend 40 years in corporate America? I could have been doing this 20 years ago. What was I waiting for? Yeah, every single time, wow. every single time. I was just camping with a guy last weekend who I told seven years ago, you need to start a business. And he fought me, oh, no, no, I have a good job. There's no such thing as a good job. I have security, no such thing. He finally started his business. We're sitting around the campfire. He's camping for nine days in a row. And he says, I could have never done this. And I said, you know, are you glad you did it? He goes, I wish I would have done it 35 years ago. Wow. I've, I've never met anybody who was like, oh, man, I'm really disappointed I started a business. Just like I've never met anybody, man, I'm really sad I gave. <laughs> and even if you're like, well, you know, with the homeless guy, he might buy alcohol. Not on you. That's not on you. God wants you to give. What they do with the money is between them and God. You did your job. Now let God do the other one. Indeed, that's right. I always tell, if, if I give to someone, I have an opportunity for a, a conversation with the person, I give it to them, but I hold on to it just for a second. I say, this is from God, not from me. He's watching what you do with it. <laughs> so use it wisely. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's an amazing thing. I, I remember one story when you were talking about your books, uh, there was some, a, a, a speaker who came to one of our Passover events and he wanted to bring his new book and, and sell it. And it was, uh, it happened to be a, a high Sabbath when we were holding this Passover. And we said, oh, we forgot to tell you, you can't sell books on the high Sabbath. And he, he told me the story just a little while ago and he says, oh, I, he was really bummed. He didn't know what he was gonna do because he spent $500 just getting the books there. And he said, well, I still wanna get rid of them. I still wanna distribute them. They've got my website on it. Maybe people will give to my ministry. Okay, well, whatever. So he announced on stage, I'm gonna give away all my books. Go ahead in, in the lobby. They're there to give. I know I, we're not gonna sell on Shabbat. Just take one. Lo and behold, one person comes by, says, I would like to buy your whole lot of books and pay double the price for them. Ever since that day, he does not sell his books anymore. He gives them away free online and gets more in donations as a result. Yep, absolutely true. Do you have time for a, a personal story that Please way? Please do, go ahead. So me and my wife travel and do a lot of speaking and we were speaking at a conference where everybody was a pastor other than me and my wife. I was just there because I'm the financial believer. So we shut down our table for Shabbat. And this was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. And everybody's like, why are you doing that? You're gonna lose so much money because really everybody's there to sell their stuff, right? And we put right on the table, close for Shabbat. And all these people were coming up asking us questions. And it, this, is a, this is why faith and business are so importantly paired. They were asking us questions about, well, is this true? Or I thought that was done away with, which first leads to a great conversation about these things. But second, these people were saying, well, if, if this is true, why are none of these pastors doing it? I looked at them, I said, great question, go ask them. So then it started getting to these other pastors. Hey, is Shabbat really done away with? We did the event the year after and two other pastors started shutting down on Shabbat. But 
back to the point. So we only sold books for like a third of the day on Sunday. And we are the number one moneymaker at these events. There's just a reality to how this works. Because when you're not after the money, that's when God knows he can trust in giving it to you. Indeed. Josh, thank you so much for sharing with us today. This has been a pleasure. I've learned a thank lot, you. and I hope our, 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 our audience has as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Shabbat Night Live. This has been uh, Scott Laird and Josh Charlie. I hope you've uh, learned something today as I have. And uh, the importance of giving is something that we never want to uh, forget. And we want to thank you for giving to Shabbat Night Live and to A Rude Awakening all year long. We really appreciate your support. We'll see you next week. Shavua Tov. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.